Hello and welcome to Strangecast, episode 11. For the love of school. Yeah, which sounds like an epithet, but it's not. So if you're new, welcome. And if you're old, welcome back. We're picking up a lot of new listeners lately, which is nice to see. And this episode is about school memories and the things that we remember maybe most fondly or most crazily. And uh, yeah, Um, actually, because I have a lot of talking to do this time, we'll start with you, my lovely wife. Okay. (laughs) Um, Well, I did just want to say that I asked Alice this morning about her school memories from primary school. Now, obviously, she's only 12. Yeah, to think about about that. Yeah, I did. Um, So... You know, it's a bit different. But she was saying how she remembered in reception, they had uh, like a corner that every half a term they would change around. So sometimes it would be like a grocer's shop. Sometimes it would be a doctor's. And this particular term, it was a hairdresser's. And they had, I don't, I didn't quite understand what it was like some kind of clip or piece of equipment or something that they had in there in this section and she was using it on another child's hair and it got stuck oh no and they had to work out how to you know tease it out carefully and everything and she was really stressed and anxious that she was going to get into trouble oops i know (laughs) bless her um so that's the first thing that came to her mind and i thought that that really shows how much she's like me because I think when you said about school memories straight away the majority that came into my head were negative ones or ones that maybe made me anxious whereas you I think the majority of yours are really positive aren't they certainly interesting yeah and mostly positive yeah. most of the ones that you've told me have been fun or you know something amusing has happened oh yeah um But, so, this one probably isn't great, but my very first memory is, again, like Alice being in reception. It's the only memory I have of this school because I then moved to a different school. Um, But there was a huge tree in the playground and my best friend in reception was a girl called Hannah. And there was a couple of tree surgeons I think they're called and they were chopping down the tree and we were absolutely devastated because we'd been watching this bird's nest and there were eggs hatched in the bird's nest and they didn't move it so when they chopped down the tree the nest fell down and we were beside ourselves with what was going to happen to these tiny baby birds Um, that's terrifying yeah kids shouldn't see that no i know i don't think anybody else really realized to be honest it was just we happened to notice and you didn't tell anybody i don't remember that's that's all i remember about that to be honest that's quite traumatic um god i I told you most of mine are not great no Um, but in secondary school i was lucky enough to go on some really cool trips so in the space of two months in I believe it was the first year of A levels. Yeah, it must have been the first year of A levels. So what would I have been 15? I lose track. I think. I mean Jake's I 15 now, now, right? Okay, so that wouldn't be A levels because he's doing GCSEs. So was I 16? Because I was always yeah, the youngest. You must have been. Okay, so I must have been 16. And <clears throat> we went the first trip was to Sitges in Barcelona. Oh, nice. For a geography trip. I and never went abroad during my school years. No? No. Oh. Boo. <laughs> um, yeah, that was for geography. And we spent a lot of time on the beach doing measurements for our geography coursework. And then we spent the evenings in the restaurants having tapas and whatever. I can't even remember the food. And drinking sangria, which the teachers knew we were drinking sangria i think they thought well you know it's okay it's just a bit of i don't even know what sangria is red wine and something no, no. else I'm, i don't drink a lot so I don't, I, don't, I don't even know what it is it's not as strong as red wine but anyway a bunch of teenagers drinking sangria getting very drunk having very horrible hangovers the next day does your mother know this uh, well guess what that, she does that's now that's an abba song does your mother know um i don't know 
And then a few weeks later, for both politics and history, we went to Russia, which obviously nowadays you would 100% not do. Um, but then it was the most incredible trip. And I am so grateful to my parents that they paid for these trips because they were really expensive, um, obviously. Of course. Um, but we we went to, we flew to, I think we flew to Moscow and then got the sleeper train a few days later, but I could have it, yeah, I think it was that way around. But as I mentioned before, my memory is absolutely shocking. Either or, I have a feeling we started in Moscow and then we got a sleeper train um, overnight to St. Petersburg. Um, and that was honestly one of the best experiences. <clears throat> Sorry. But also absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Because Russia <laughs> is, I mean, now it's, you know, it, interesting. I'm going to try not you to could say, that. say anything too awful. But back then, even, it was terrifying to the point where we were told not to wear jeans because there would be groups of children that would swarm you in the streets to steal your jeans because they were worth money there. Now, how true that is, of course, is down to Western media and such. So, um, I mean, this was coming from the teachers that had been there before mm. and the, gu the guides. So, yeah, I don't know. But I was quite good friends with a boy on the trip and we were in the markets one day and we were buying Russian hats and there were some very creepy men that were very insistent on buying me from him. Buying you? Yeah. Wow. That was <clears throat> an interesting one. Um, there was also, now this didn't happen to me. This was one of the girls that was with us. Um who left her iPod, that's how old this was, um, <laughs> on the plane and didn't realise until we'd got to this hotel that we were staying in. And in order for her to be able to claim it back from the insurance, they had to make a police report. So they sent her and one of the female teachers, who was absolutely tiny, she was five foot, if that, they sent the two of them what? off to the police station. That's not even half a Jake. I know, sorry, bear with me one sec. <clears throat> it's that it's horrible that time back of, of throat thing time of year everyone i don't even have a cold it just gets me you pretend um i don't so off they go to the police station and they have to they're told they have to sit and wait to speak to somebody and they glance over and look under the chairs in front of them and there is a gun Ooh. just casually under the chair so they're sort of looking at it feeling a bit uncomfortable because the policemen there all have and the policemen that walk down the streets at the time and I'm guessing still now, all have machine guns. Not just, you know, small pistols, but full-blown machine guns in, you know, regular use. Right. And they're sat there and the one of the policemen obviously clocked what they had seen, went over, picked it up and shot it or fired it right above their head. Now, it didn't have any bullets in, but he didn't know because it apparently had been left by a previous person that was sat there. So and it, could have. it was a joke from this police officer. Absolutely terrifying for them. Um, that brings a whole new meaning to Russian roulette, you know? Just oh saying. my gosh. Um, pretty, pretty and we crazy. stayed in this hotel where there were um, regular prostitutes working, going up and down in the lifts, um, being quite suggestive to some of the boys that were on the trip. Um, they served green beer, which is what we were given to drink. Um, Very odd. Yeah. And then we we only stayed there for a few days, thankfully, because the food was absolutely horrendous. I don't think I ate anything. Luckily, my mum sent me with boxes and boxes of cereal bars, and that was all I ate. Cereal bars. Cereal bars. And then, yeah, then we got the sleeper train where you don't sleep because you're literally lying on a board that is the width of your shoulders and that's it. Yep. Um, and it stops at other places. And again, there are people marching up and down with guns. I mean, it's just insane compared to the life that, you know, we have. Um, I can't really imagine that, to be honest. No. And we visited a, a Russian school and, you know, we had lots of fun experiences, but it was 
terrifying at the same time. What about the suitcase on the way back? Oh, so I had a suitcase that I think we bought from the local market. So it probably wasn't the best quality, like a big suitcase because, you know, we had to take lots of thermals and everything because it was, I think it got down to minus eight when we were there. Ah, um, welcome to Estonia. Yeah, exactly. Um, and on the way back, traveling back, the zip on the suitcase broke and I couldn't obviously close it. So the teachers ran out and got some, you know, thick sellotape and we sellotaped the whole bag closed to make sure that it was okay. Got to the airport. This was flying home. So that doesn't look at all dodgy. Well, exactly. I mean, yeah, but with a school of children... It's Surely, the best place to hide it. Well, maybe. But they were suspicious and they made us cut it open and have a look. It was so embarrassing, honestly. Absolutely just the worst thing that a teenager could experience in that moment, having all of their stuff gone through at the airport. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, and then we had to reseal and tape it back up. And once it had been fully checked, that there was nothing hidden inside. So, yeah. That's pretty wild. <laughs> Yeah. I don't think any of my stories are quite that crazy. I mean, maybe partly, but not like that. Well, it's your turn now. Earliest memory first. Earliest memory first. Okay, so I'm going to talk about my boarding school more than anything uh, in this podcast. Because my day school, I remember it just sort of getting on the bus, going to school and coming home again. I don't remember anything really stand out, which is a shame because I'm sure I had great times there. But by the end of that, uh, day school period there were only 20 students left and so everybody dispersed in 1992 to go to other schools and the first experience I remember of going to my school that I was going to be in for the next eight years was my mum and I taking a train from London to Worcester for the day um, to see the place and I think we changed trains or something happened and I fell between the train and the platform which, being a very small child, was easy to do. Luckily, my mum uh, was very quick, and she uh, grabbed me under the arms and saved me. But uh, I remember limping the rest of the day. Oh. But, but what, tell everybody how old you would have been. Yeah, I was eight slash nine at that point. Um, very small, and I was the youngest in the school. Now, the, the best part of that day, actually, was that the school dinners at Worcester College, where I attended for eight years, were fantastic, right? Probably some of the best... Again, uh, it's all about the food. It's, it, listen, that's just how it is. The food that we had, or at least that I had, when we got to the dining room, they were serving poppadoms and curry for lunch. So, yeah, we travelled all the way from London, starving stomach. I don't remember anything about the train journey. I just remember that that lunch and saying, Mum, I want to come here. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first one. Now, I then, um, I don't know how long it was between that, because as a kid, I knew nothing about months. Just things happened, right? Um, I then went to Worcester for a week assessment uh, to see if I would be a good fit. And I only remember that my dad drove me up that time. And I don't remember anything about uh, anything else about that week other than I got quite familiar with the school building because, you know, you're there for a week instead of a day. So that was cool. Which meant that the first time I went to the school proper, um, I was quite familiar with the school building. Now, I have to tell you about my journey up on day one of my actual start to school. There are three of us, four of us in my dad's car. My dad had already done the drive, so he thought he knew it all. Didn't really consult maps, and we got lost somewhere in Wales. Now what I remember about this trip distinctly was that we had a tape that was playing continuously. And one of the songs on that tape was Janet K. Silly Games, which is a reggae song. And I can't think of that song anymore without thinking about that car journey from hell and how late I got there compared to everybody else. Because we did eventually get there, but it was... Everybody was basically getting ready for bed. I missed all the orientation stuff. It was it was kind of like that. So in the car was me, my mum, my uncle Paul, and my dad. And I'm sure you can imagine there were probably some harsh words said. Because it was that kind of a drive. So by the time we get there, it must be eight, nine o'clock at night. Everybody, small kids, getting ready for bed. And uh, there's me just starting to unpack. <clears throat> Excuse me. So everybody leaves. I say bye to my family and everything. The last to leave, of course. And I hadn't had any dinner because there wasn't really a time to stop. 
So, because I'd been at the school before for my week assessment, and I was in a house called Peggy Marks, uh, I knew my way around it, and I was staying with my roommate friend called Sebi, who I met that day. And I said to Sebi, I know it's the first day, but how about we go downstairs, because I want to find some food. I was very precocious, apparently. How old was Sebi compared to you? I think he was a year older. Okay, so quite young as well. I was nine. And I went downstairs, and I remembered where the house parent's uh, front door was. So, And she had a dog called Gypsy, I remember that. So I rang the bell, Gypsy starts barking. This house parent comes out, she's lovely, Miss Calder, never forget her. Lovely Scottish lady, um, like a less strict McGonagall, <laughs> <laughs> right? Really nice. And I told her my problems. because Instead of shouting at me and being all strict and sending me to bed with no food, she made me some toast. So I, I had a midnight feast on day one or day zero before my actual school day. Then she sent us up to bed, and I slept well. So that's the first memory I have, um, or memories at least. And then all sorts of other things, like the first weekend after that, my mum came up. I think she came with my nan this time. And I remember that she bought everybody in the house a load of snacks, because she would do that sort of thing. She came up with a whole bunch of, I think, probably Capricorn drinks and things, and some crisps. And everybody had a good sort of Saturday um, impromptu thing. So I didn't expect them to come up. Back then, you know, no one had mobile phones and you kind of had to um, book time in the phone box to ring home. And that assumed that you had pounds or, you know, any kind of change. So I didn't talk to her a lot the first week. I missed her terribly. Uh, and being so young as well, away from home. I mean, can you imagine sending our kids away from home age nine? No, absolutely <laughs> not. And I remember saying this to you when they were babies. I just don't know how your... I mean, obviously your mum did it and it was the best thing for you. And she was incredibly strong to be able to do that because I do not think at all that there is any way that I could send them off. Like, no, she was incredible to be able to do that for you and give you that opportunity. Yeah, all yeah. the way from London as well. That's two and a half I mean, hours. Jake is currently away. This is why we're doing this podcast about school. He's currently on a residential trip, Monday to Wednesday. So it's only two nights, but... Even that, we miss him so much. Just, you know, and he's a teenager. He sits in his room on his computer. We see him for what, maybe an hour all together. If you're lucky. In the whole day, if that. But just having his presence here, we miss him so much. So to think, you know, how your mum must have felt not even being able to speak to you. Most of the time. Yeah. You know, Jake <laughs> at least has his mobile. And uh, yeah, that, that's a whole different ball game, isn't it? Um, mm. I, I think she must have been. She was young as well. She had me very young. She must have been twenty-five or twenty-six years old. Yeah. So twenty-six, a nine-year-old in boarding school can't see them. That's the whole world. That's different. Yeah. She did say that the day after I left, she did the usual thing of making me breakfast, Aww. brought it in, and I wasn't there. Oh. And it made her cry. I bet. <laughs> that made me really sad. Oh my gosh. And that's crazy. But there are lots of other sorts of memories. Like, because I was there for so long, it became a home away from home in a way. So I remember my school days honestly quite fondly. I couldn't tell you much about the lessons or anything. I could tell you memories about the teachers and, you know, some of the crazy things. But I just remember the place as a whole being a nice place. And it's weird because even today, I occasionally have dreams about being back on campus and knowing my way around still because it never leaves you. So I remember I had a dream about being there in the summer once and walking from what was like the coffee bar or leisure block to my residence. And it's quite an open air campus. Do you remember we went there in 2008, didn't we? I was just going to say you should tell them how we visited. Yeah. You took me there. I took you there um, because we were staying in a, a hotel up there. And that's also where I proposed to you. It is. I don't think that ever, that did not come up in our Gumtree episode, oddly. No, it didn't. But we went to the school. And we got out of the taxi at the school and the, um, I think it was the deputy head at the time, he spotted us within like seven seconds of getting out of the cab. <laughs> and he remembered me because it had only been, oh gosh, that's really telling how, how crazy this was. Because I left in 2000, it'd only been eight years since I was last there. So, you know, in easy memory. And uh, I walked you around and I showed you off to some of the teachers <laughs> and I bragged about you. Aww. 
And we went in the main building and I played one of the pianos upstairs, didn't did, I? did, yeah. I was a, it was a really tiny room for such a huge piano. The piano took up half of the room. Yeah, it did. It was it a was, grand Yeah, piano. tiny, tiny room, but... But that's yeah. that's all a music room needs to be, you know? True. It's just enough room to squeeze in behind the keyboard and you're fine. Yeah. But the building, I, I can walk around that, no pun intended, blindfold, and, and still know where everything is. I have been back a few times since. The last time was, I think, in 2020, just before COVID, possibly. Um, and then I was going to go back again, and I caught COVID, so I couldn't go back. That sucked. Mm. But yeah, I've been back a few times since, and it's just always so nostalgic. And there's, you go to a place, and there's always like a, a smell. And I don't mean a bad thing, but you know, if you've ever been to your granny's house or your auntie's house or something, and there's always like a particular smell that just takes you immediately back to that place. Yeah. That happened. Every time I went back there, it happened. And there was a clock on top of the school building that would go ding dong and chime uh, the hour and all the other, you know, the, the 15 minutes. And that also was very nostalgic. Hearing that, I was standing outside the main building after lunch one time, and I just remember catching that and going, yep, that's the sign that lessons will be commencing soon. And of course, you hear the school bell and everything. So the main building was separate from the halls of residence, and you'd walk between them. So you were never stuck inside like one single building, um, in the same way that, for example, Hogwarts is, where all the houses are in one <laughs> building. No, it's true. I think there probably are schools that like that, but I've never been to one. And... Um, yeah, all kind of different things. I'm trying to think because I had tons. Actually, I'll tell you a story about getting, not getting to school on time one day, many years later. And it was because there were there was flooding somewhere outside Reading. So normally I take a direct train from Paddington to Worcester. And by this time I was, I think, in year 11 or something. So I was doing this trip on my own. Um, in the early days I did it with a bunch of schoolmates and our parents would pick us up from the station or the other way around teachers that pick us up at the other end with a school bus but at that point you're expected to do it on your own and you can pick whatever train time you want right mm -hmm. so um i knew that there was flooding and i knew i'd have to change trains and this is mobile phones had just kind of come into being and they were sort of primitive so there was no texting easily because they didn't talk but you could at least ring people on your speed dial and everything now my mum had a hospital appointment that day and it was very important she went in so she would gone into hospital and I was stuck in Reading train station because I got off the train at Reading and I was told, all right, a guard will pick you up. They do know you're coming. I must have been sat there for two or three hours at this point. Nothing happened. And because, well, so much was different and I could barely hear where anything was. So I didn't want to walk around the station because all I could hear was diesel trains in front of me. But I did hear a squeaky door behind me. This helped. Otherwise, I'd probably still be sat there like 25 years <laughs> later, truthfully, I was just on a bench. Nobody came to check up on me. So I get up and I walk behind the bench with my gear and everything and a cane and a suitcase. And it was all trouble. And I push open this squeaky door. And let me tell you, uh, before we started recording, you told me about the lady in the post office. Yeah. With the scowliest face. It was the scowliest, grumpiest face I've ever seen. Well, if you imagine that, probably a little extra. That's what I got coming out of the door at me. And she's wow. like, don't you know this is a lady's toilet? What are you doing opening a door, you dirty man? I said, madam, I'm blind. I have a cane and I need help. Yeah, it was kind of like that. <laughs> Stunned silence for a beat or two. And then somebody else, because I think she walked away in a bit of shame, walked me to the ticket office and they said, ah, oh, yeah. We didn't mean to just abandon you. We will pay for a cab for you to get to school. And they wow. did. I had to get a cab all the way from Reading to Worcester. And how much did that cost? Nothing. No, but did, did you ever find out how much it cost them? I have absolutely no idea. We could price it up now. It'd be a laugh. You could like an Uber from Reading to London. I'd be quite, from Reading to Worcester. I'd be quite curious. It wouldn't have been that much now. You think? I mean, back then, sorry. No, I mean, but it would be quite, I mean... I mean, if it was like a company account, probably not. I'd probably get a discount. But I imagine it can't have been too cheap. Probably 80, 90 quid. I don't know, maybe more. Um, and that's not even counting for inflation. I have no idea. Mm. But, um, you know, I basically fell asleep in the back of the cab and just had to trust the driver could find the place. He did. And I got there again late, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. Um, way longer than I should have. But I was able to at least call my mum. Um because she had a phone with her as well, even though probably in the hospital it was turned off, so I could only catch her at like a particular time. And I explained everything that had gone on. She was pissed. 
She was absolutely livid. Um, and she's like, well, serves them right for not sorting you out. Put you in a But cab. did she know where you were? Because surely when you didn't arrive at school, did they not contact her and say, or no. they just weren't expecting you? So No, they weren't expecting me because, of course, as I say, you could get whatever train you yeah, wanted. Of course. So they wouldn't have known when to expect me. Mm. When I checked in and signed in is when I was expected, you know? Um, so it was all a bit of a mess, really. But I got there when I got there. And the first thing I had to do was make my bed. I remember that. I was so knackered. All I wanted to do was sleep. But nope, I had to put my sheets on and make the bed. And did I find food? I have no idea. You know me and Aww. food. You think I'd remember that, but I didn't. You <laughs> need to learn to take some snacks with you. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Always my mom carry a snack. Thing. Always carry a snack with you. Yep. But yeah, that was, that was not a good one. But, you know, um, aside from that, to be honest, most of my school days were super cool. So... A fun one then. In the sixth form, uh, I still have, um, and I'm so glad about that, a friend of mine called James Berry. And we would often shop together, right? So we'd do the, a weekly shop on Fridays. We got a, a, an allowance from the school. It helped you make, make you more independent. So because the dining hall was closed um, on Saturday and Sundays, we would have an allowance to get some food and we would go to Tesco or Sainsbury's. I forget which it was. Buy a bus and do all these things. Occasionally, um, in the sixth form, one of the staff would take us, and that was all good. Now, I don't remember if this was like James and I went by bus or whether we got taken, but we bought a load of stuff like chicken Kiev and Swiss roll and chocolate gato. All the healthy stuff. All the healthy stuff. <laughs> Sunny D as well, by the way. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it was great, right? So I remember we, ca and, and we also bought what we thought, but it turned out to just be like baguette. We thought it was garlic bread. Ah. Uh. It wasn't, <laughs> right? So we get... That must have been a disappointment. Well, you will see. Um, we got back, and I think it must have been like Monday lunch, because we were sick formers. We could go back to our um, hostel in the lunchtime if we wanted to and eat there. You couldn't go back if you were in the lower years, though, because your houses were locked. Sixth form was never locked during the day. Mm. So <clears throat> one of the experiences uh, was that we put what we thought was garlic bread in the oven, it was just a baguette. So, you know, we waited a bit and the cleaner came in and said, there's something in the oven. Should it be there? And we said, yeah, we we'll hope so. And uh, she's like, well, it didn't look like it's doing much. And then we get to it and she said, oh, you've just basically cooked a baguette. It was not garlic bread. <laughs> so that was a waste of time. I don't know. I mean, they felt the same. And I think the people that were helping us around the shop maybe just didn't realize. I don't know. It was a silly thing. But the more funny one was that we were sharing a big Swiss roll, you know, the big family size one. Yeah. And I think we were just talking like we are now, and we were just cutting bits off of it either end, standing at the chopping board. And then we realized that we had scoffed an entirety of a family size Swiss roll <laughs> in about 20 minutes just wow. together like this. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> it was. It was funny, but it was ter it was it was quite funny. Mm-hmm. But what I distinctly remember is that on Saturday nights, we would sit in the comm room because um, the, the sixth form has sort of like these units um, where you'd have, you know, groups of people living in different parts of the building. And there was a TV in each of the common rooms. And what we would do is basically cook off whatever we had left over. So I remember we did some southern fried chicken and some chips and stuff in the oven. And again, one of these massive chocolate gatos. And uh, we would watch casualty. So... The music of Casualty now reminds me of the smell of my sixth form common room plus Kiev plus Southern Fried Chicken. It's so and chips. funny, isn't it, how that works? It is. It's just really weird. But it's it's kind of stuck in my head that way. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so there's yeah, I mean, because all of my school memories don't really involve home, there's few of those. What about trips? Did you ever do any trips or excursions or anything like that? Yes, that actually. Ah. Yeah, you reminded me of something. <laughs> and I, w I was thinking about it yesterday when Jake left and I forgot, but you reminded me. So we did a few different trips. Um, one of them was to a place called, I think it was called Outward Bound. Mm -hmm. And um, again, must have been sort of year 11 or year 12 or something. And um, we did it at the beginning of the year. It was like an icebreaker so that the new people coming into the school you didn't know who came in from other schools, we'd get to meet. And it was like a week kind of, you know, orientation and meet them and stuff. Yeah. Outside of school. And it was lots of fun. We do activities. It's like a team bonding, isn't it? Yeah. 
And um, it so happened that in the common room of this place, there was a drinks machine. And allegedly, yeah, allegedly, mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you get your fingers up underneath the front of the screen, you could take <laughs> apart two plastic tabs, allegedly, and get out a free drinks cartridge. Uh -huh. So what you'd do, allegedly, is you'd buy one drink so that you had a plastic cup. And then if you wanted another free drink after that, you would put your fingers under these plastic tabs and get whatever cartridge you could line up with. And uh, it was somebody's job, I couldn't possibly say who, uh, who could do this and could work the machine enough to get people who wanted a drink. Sneaky. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I don't know how that happened or what happened there. Um, I could have also sneaky. dreamt that. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, sure. Sure, right. Just to cover your back. Of course. <laughs> Not my back. Someone's back. Someone's back. Yeah. But those were fun trips. Um, we did another one to a place called Dine Door, which was in Hereford, I think. And basically, it was like a big field with a couple of raised concrete pads, which you could put tents up on or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a, like a, I can't remember what it was like, if it was a portable kitchen. Well, not portable, but like a separate kitchen. And I remember that there were three big gas bottles outside that were connected to gas cookers in the kitchen you would cook a uh, meal for all of the people and that was fun so we got to basically you know um learn to cook and cook for everybody in the place with the help of the teachers and everything of course and there was a big mess tent with a big almost like a huge shower curtain over the top of some poles yeah so it was all open air and we camped in tents and we had a massive fire pit and you'd light stuff and oh it was good did they ever take you to any theme parks because i remember being taken I think it was in year seven to, I want to say Chessington, World of Adventures, but I I think it was Chessington and nearly getting lost, well, left off of the coach because we got stuck on, they had a, I think it was a bubble ride or something it was called and you sat on one of those big um, sort of round boat things and you went right. through the water and stuff and our one got stuck and oh, no. my friend at the time Bianca and I were stuck on this ride and then we got off and realized that it was 10 minutes past the time we were all supposed to meet back at the coach and uh oh yeah a big stress that we were going to miss the coach and they were going to leave us of course no teachers would ever do that um of course not and when we eventually did get back to the coach we were not the only ones that were late so it was fine but you know, in that panic when you're in year seven and you're, you know, you don't want, desperately don't want to get into trouble. Um, I mean, that's only Alice's age, right? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. <clears throat> Imagine her. She would freak out. Yes, yeah, she would. Yeah. I'd be, I feel very sorry for her, to be honest. <laughs> we yeah. did go to Alton Towers. Oh, and yeah? I really, really liked the cable cars that took you between sections. I've never been there. It's cool. We should go. I feel like that's one of the ones that's quite <clears throat> roller coaster heavy. But there's yeah. other things too. Maybe. We'll go as a family and I'll get you on one ride. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Not a roller coaster, that's for sure. No, something nice and tame for yeah, you. Yeah, maybe. Because it would offend your sensibilities. <laughs> and Alice. We don't do uh, oh, scary yeah. things. Oh, you and yeah. Jake go off and do the high adrenaline. And Alice and I will just sit on a nice little boat somewhere and bob along. Okay. <laughs> That's what we like. We could look and see what they've got. Because, of course, it's been 25 years. I'm sure it's all different mm. now. Might so, so they're getting to these places. They don't make it easy. No, it's such a trek to get anywhere because we don't drive. Nope. Not yet. No, yeah, that's it. We need Jake. A couple of years, we'll get Jake driving, get him his car, and that'll be it. We'll be all over the place. We'll be set, won't we? He was already, actually, I know this is, you know, slightly diverting from what we were talking about but he was already talking about when we were at Disney um because so many people drive there um how he would want to do that next time and take all of us and drive and then we could buy because he saw this amazing huge lego set like it was huge it would have filled one whole side of our suitcase so yeah. obviously he couldn't you know we couldn't buy it Wow. Um, but he was like, oh, if I drove, if I had the car, we could. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Well, so. given that then, if we're still doing the Belgium trip uh, in a few years, <clears throat> that's me and my band anyway, I think I'll mm -hmm. have him drive me instead of Alf. Yeah. And I can bring back all kinds of goodies. You can indeed. Oh, 
planning ahead. Yeah. See, all the holidays and trips we'll have with Jake the driver. Jake the driver. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really fun. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> so, um, what happens when your parent, right, has to go away, uh, and I mean abroad, for an extended period of time? And what happens when somebody, somebody discovers that if you press a particular part of the wire underneath the phone box, you can essentially make free calls? Somebody has sent a phone card, and that phone card got used, and then the phone box got used to make cheap calls? And it was possibly said that, uh, I, I can't back this up at all now, um, that the 0891 50, 50, 50 lines and things like that would get called at odd times of the day mm-hmm. by various people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you tell a child not to drink coffee and they want to try it because the parents say, don't do that. You tell them, don't call these naughty numbers, say you want to do it. You're a bit mischievous, weren't you? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I don't. I have no idea. Oh dear. But it was it was such that a few people got told about a trick so that all the blame could not land upon one person. Ah. You see? Yep. Um this is all hearsay by the way. I have no idea about any of this. No, of course not. Um but it was easy in a particular house to make free phone calls. And uh, a few people did indeed do that. Mm-hmm. Let's say. Phone calls to... Anywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. And anything. Oh, dear. <laughs> and Powerful. I think I think there was some talk um, at the fact that the money within the phone box did not equate to the bill upon the line, mm. shall we say. <clears throat> but, yeah. Did they do anything? Did they stop the use of the phone? They didn't stop the use of the phone. They tried to patch the problem. Ah, oh, okay. And it worked for a bit. Mm. But I think there was also another way around it. (laughs) Honestly. I, yeah. It was an interesting experience, an interesting time, sure. But then, to be honest, it became kind of a moot point because a few years later, mobile phones became a thing and it didn't matter as much. Yeah. But yeah. Do you know what? I don't know what they do now. I would assume they, well, I don't know, actually. My guess is they probably still have phone boxes, but... You know, with everybody being the age at which Worcester is now and having probably everybody has a phone. I should ask. I don't know. But there are still some parents that are very anti Quite rightly, I get it. Phones and Yeah. Maybe it's more of the what we call brick phones, you know? Yes. Have internet access. I know my dad gives his younger kids those. Yeah. And I, I, I understand that, to be honest. Yeah. Maybe had we known about them we'd have done it, but we didn't. Well, I, yeah, friends. I think if if our kids were a bit younger and come, just coming into that, you know, wanting a phone and stuff, yeah, I think it would have been different. But you know, we're already Way in past. the yeah having <laughs> iPhones and access. I mean, Alice doesn't have access to social media. No. Again, this is a whole different conversation. But we are stricter with that perhaps than we were with Jake, but then I don't feel like he had that much interest. No. Whereas... She do. Yeah, I think maybe for girls it's a bit different. But again, that's a different... Maybe a whole different episode. (laughs) Well, it's a curiosity. Like, how do... I mean, you know, parents dealing with kids at school. Like, if if a whole school or a whole class of people uh, is on a particular network and you don't want your child to be, then what do you do about that? Mm. School memories. Yeah. Wow. Well, I don't know how long this has been. I feel like it's been interesting, though. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Hearing about your escapades. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know if they were all mine. No, of course not. No. <laughs> I was a really good boy all the time. Yeah, okay. That's why I got into not trouble <laughs> oh dear but it's you know this is it's interesting to think back about times that are now making you feel old so long ago like yeah. it's weird to think that i mean i asked you the other day what year you left school and you had to think about it i still would i'm still not 100 percent sure 
I know what year I left school because I went to college directly after. Okay, so three years later must be the year. <laughs> must be. Yes. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, um, once I'd, I I went to college the first time with my mum, so I could get settled in. And that was all well and good. But the, the next time I went on my own, because I could, and it was exactly the same route to Worcester, right? I went to, to, to college in Hereford, which is just up the train, up the track from Worcester. And you just stayed on a bit longer. Well, that's it. But the first time I heard one of the Worcester stations, I started to prepare myself to get off the train. <laughs> and I realised, wait a minute, this is not my stop anymore. No. And you know what is weird. interesting to think is the technology that's different from when we were at school. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it... I guess it, it would have been different for you, but when I was in primary school, it was all chalk, chalk on a blackboard in like the lo the lower years of primary school, early years. That's what they used. And then as we got a little bit older, it was, you know, the, the wipe clean boards with pens. And then further along in secondary school, it was, do you remember like, did they ever have the projectors? I, get, I don't know if they would have used them in your school because obviously it's to project a picture, so it's to see. But maybe if there were people who had some sight in your school, they might have used them. I don't know. But they were massive, big, blocky um, boxes, I guess, yeah. that used the lights to project. Um, I don't know what the paper was because it wasn't paper. It was like a clear see-through sheet that had printed on whatever the writing or image was and it would use the light and project it onto a like clear a whiteboard. Or a screen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and they would have to then, you know, switch out each page to change it. And I remember... So it's early PowerPoint. <laughs> basically, yeah, but very primitive. Now, I mean, at the time it was, you know, it was fine. It was great. That was what everybody used. But now when you think that if you wanted to show a whole presentation, you'd have to have printed out on this special clear see-through, I don't know what it was called. It's not cellophane, but it's, you know, that, that kind, of, kind thing. of thing. And you'd have to switch out each one and it was so long-winded. But then I think it would have been in my GCSE year that they started to have like a projector that was stuck to the ceiling, which then projected down onto the board and was controlled via the computer. And when they worked, because, you know, computers, um, they were really cool and only certain classrooms had them and certain teachers had access to them and things. And now, yeah, I don't think the kids have ever used a chalkboard except for when they were, you know, babies running around in baby rooms that had paint on you know painting boards on one side and chalk on the other in school settings that's never been a thing it's all computers and you know i don't i don't know if they use whiteboards we should ask the because i have yeah, no idea the wipe clean boards well i thought we were done but now you've given me a plethora of new things <laughs> that i want to talk about oh there you go so we're not done okay so another early memory very early right again i'm it's very small. I'm nine years old. They stopped doing this very soon after. Um, but I remember that uh, in the first year that I was at this uh, in Worcester College, um, we had to carry brailers and all our books under our arms from our form room to the library where we would do what they called prep, which is just homework. It was just a fancy word, but they called it prep. Yeah. It was a posh boarding school. What can I say? <laughs> So, you know, you'd be walking through the corridors, lots of blind people with heavy items. Perkins Brailers, by the way, are very heavy. Think How of big sort are of they? small portable typewriters oh, made wow. of okay. very heavy metal. If you dropped one out of a window, it would kill someone. If you dropped it on your foot, it would break your feet. Yeah. Even the other one that wasn't near it. Gosh. So, yeah, not only do you have to navigate around the school, you've got to carry all this stuff. And the bigger kids, who were bigger than you, and could just knock you flying, even, you know, on a staircase. Um, like, this didn't happen, by the way, but it could have. Or at least it didn't happen to me. It probably happened to somebody. Um, being knocked around by these heavy brailers just could have gone flying. So did you, walking around the school, did you walk around with 
um, with your cane or anything? Nope. No canes in the building. Wow. You were not supposed to do that. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So before I come back to what I wanted to talk about, that reminds me of something else. (laughs) I was a rebel. I mean, you know this already, having heard some of today's escapades. But in RNC after Worcester, which is, you know, my college after Worcester, they did expect you to use canes in the building. Mm-hmm. and between uh, the halls of residence and the main building. I did not do this because Worcester did not set me up for that. I was a cane user, but I refused to use one on campus. And uh, there was a road crossing outside the building where you cross between uh, the halls of residence and the ca- and the main building. And I used to not even wait for the traffic light occasionally. If it was really quiet, I'd use my ears and then I would just cross dangerous Terrible. without a cane as well mm-hmm. and uh, it used to very upset the mobility staff at rnc they would always be like where's your cane andre where's your cane it's in my dorm room <laughs> and i would plow down the middle of the corridor i wouldn't knock people i wasn't dangerous or anything but um i did not like carrying a cane anywhere on campus and for the two years i was there i didn't do it lots of other people did but because worcester kind of instilled into me don't use a cane in the building i didn't do it yeah and i I kind of I had good mobility skills and I just decided I wasn't going to do it. So, and I think they'd never seen anybody quite like that, so brazen. Um, and I think uh, that's it, definitely you. It worried them, <laughs> but nope, I didn't do it. I was one of the few not to. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so yeah. back to your original, carrying around your books and. Well, that's it. You know, I mean, it became dangerous, and you would often hear the clunk of two brailers meeting in the corridor oh. and go, "Oh, sorry." Oh, sorry, there's another one. You drop all your files. And it was awkward. You'd have to carry your files under your arm and a brailer under your arm, and you'd use your other hand to make sure that you could, you know, touch the railing and go down. Mm. I don't know why they did that. But then um, in future years, it was such that you stayed in your own form room and a sixth form uh, student who was tasked with supervising prep and making sure you worked would come to you. Much better. I don't know why they didn't do that to begin with. But your talk of um, projectors and things made me think about all the technology that we used, because that's a really interesting topic as well. So uh, we used, or at least I did, I used a brailer, a Perkins brailer, which is writing uh, braille onto paper. And braille paper is thicker than A4 paper and slightly different sized. I don't know the exact size, but somebody will. And um, there weren't that many computerized things in Worcester at the beginning. Um, not in the classrooms anyway, there was a computer room, or two of them side by side, and in those there were BBC computers, which had all sorts of school software on them, like WordWise. Yeah, WordWise was our um, word processor. And there was also school-wide email. There was no internet as such back then. We didn't get internet for a few years. So there was that. But in maths and English and everything, everybody everything was done on paper, so brailers. And what would happen is every desk had a brailler down and right in the cubby hole under a drawer. In the drawer above there was braille paper, but underneath that in the little cubby hole was a Perkins brailler and um, a mat. <laughs> because brailers are noisy things. So you take the mat out, you put that flat on your desk, and you put the brailler on top of it, and it was sized to fit. And then you would roll your paper in and begin your work. And that was true of every single desk in any lesson I would go to. So it meant that you'd no longer had to carry around your own personalized brailler. Good idea. Much better. <laughs> Good idea. Now, geography and maths had some of the most interesting um, physical media that I can remember. In maths, we had something called German film, right? which is nothing to do with cinematography or TV. It was something that you would put on a rubber mat and you would screw it down at the top. And this was for writing out, or not really writing, but uh, drawing out angles that you could then feel, right? I don't know how this works, even today. It's really interesting stuff. I'd love to get some and show you. Mm. It's very thin plastic, and what you do is you draw on it with a dead biro. So no ink. So you purposefully, I think they made them at the end, was that it basically pens without any ink in, or pens that were finished with. And you could feel the line behind the pen. So cool. Like an imprint. Well, it was more like an outprint. Because I don't I still don't know how it did it, but it would actually make a physically raised line behind the pen. No idea how they came up with this technology. It was amazing, right? So you could do your maths like this with 
protractors and rulers and you could draw lines and things and you could feel it and you could submit work like this and teachers <laughs> teachers could read braille and um they could help you to to do things and the other technology that we used was something uh, two different technologies one was called thermoform and what thermoform would do would be to make um typed up braille or you know from a brailler on paper into again a different type of plastic and this meant that you could type up a worksheet a teacher could type up a worksheet once and then have it printed off you know 15 20 times so that cool. it could go into books the thing about that thermo that particular type of plastic is it's it's stuck to your fingers so if you had sweaty fingers it just Ew. was hard to read <laughs> yeah it was crazy and you just have books and books of this stuff masses of books of this thermoform paper but it was all done in house worcester had a really good technology department kind of down in the ground on the ground floor and you'd walk past and you'd be hearing all these massive machines going all day chuntering along making all this noise wow. and ah uh, that must be a worksheet for some year or something. Maybe it's mine. Maybe it's year seven. I don't know. Maybe it's the sixth form. You'd never know. But you just hear it all the day. And there was another... The last one I wanted to talk about was this um, called Minolta paper. I think Minolta is a well-known company. They made photographic stuff. Um, and what that was, again, was another type of technology. There were two types of Minolta paper. The earlier stuff was quite rough to the texture, almost like a matte feeling. And it had a particularly annoying smell to it. So when you were handed books of this, and this is for doing pictures, right? Thermoform was for really mostly doing braille um, so that you wouldn't rub out the uh, the paper because mm. you wouldn't want to have books read by loads and loads of students yeah. that was all paper all the time. But Minolta now was for geography or doing stuff that was picture. So you could get a picture. Um, I don't, again, know how it worked. I'd love to go back and learn all this stuff now, Mulder. And I think it could basically take a picture from a, from a scanner and then turn it into something that you could feel. They could blow up the size of it by however many factors. So that was cool. So it didn't describe the picture. You'd feel the actual... You would feel the actual picture. Picture. So, wow. for example, one, one year, a geography teacher at great expense, because I, mean, I think the sheet of Minolta paper was 50 pence a sheet back then. Wow. She did a geography card of the pyramids, or, or a pyramid. And I kept that around for years. I loved it. And she'd written Happy Christmas under it in Braille. But wow. it was using the Minolta paper so you could feel what a pyramid would feel like. Yeah. And there were no descriptions. No, you had to learn it. So that was really cool. But the second Minolta paper was the best kind because it had a really nice smell to it. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember sniffing the book. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was crazy. So that was kind of technology in the 90s because uh, I first went to school in 1992 and left in 2000. Um, it didn't change much in the two years after that. RNC had a lot of the same stuff. But... It was computerized a lot. So all my music work in RNC was most, well, most of it was computerized. I did very little Braille work in those next two years. But the first eight years of my life was a lot of uh, physical writing um, with Braille and a lot of reading on Braille paper um, and the Minolta stuff I talked about and the German film as well. Those were like the main things. So I suppose that's also part of school memories. Because these days, a lot of blind students don't read braille and i think they should by the way because it increases literacy skills and what have you but a lot of people rely on software versions of these things and i don't think you can really get the same understanding by listening to a description of something than you can feeling it yeah if i'd have <laughs> if i'd have told myself that 25 years ago i'd have scoffed <laughs> because i didn't like anything like that but i know better now so your thoughts of the projector and stuff we should have had projectors in every classroom, you know, because blindness is not like a sort of black and white thing. You're not, you're not blind or you're not, right? There's partially sighted people, as you know, you've met some. Yeah. And we would watch videos like in history or in um, science occasionally. You'd watch videos like BBC or Channel 4, you know, the look ahead, read ahead stuff, whatever it was called, look and read, yeah. those kind of things. And I just remember they were on really crappy, probably black and white, but maybe color TVs. But if we'd have had projectors, the partially sighted uh, students wouldn't have had to sit so close like getting square eyes essentially um well these particular projectors were not ones for video they were the sort of you know the paper stuff slides oh, yeah. or whatever yeah um i mean not slides that's even older but um so it wouldn't have played a film but if they were using images or whatever they could have it could have helped 
that could have yeah been i know that there maybe. were cctvs um and i think most people think of cctv as the cameras that you know spot you on the street but cctv can also mean um like a, a tv with a camera underneath it so you basically have a movable sliding stand if you will or like a platform and you yeah. can put your book under it and have it magnified so oh, there wow. were yeah there were these all over the place for partially sighted students yeah so if you couldn't see the book as it was you could magnify it and blow it up to whatever size the cctv allowed you to do that's and that's where cool. cctv really comes from close circuit television mm. so you had a camera with a light um and different cctv models could do all sorts of different functions and as we you know as we got toward the millennium as it were they got more and more advanced but most of the old ones were just i think probably black and white with a very average camera and you'd put your book under it and you'd maybe squint a bit and hope you could see it from what i know i mean i don't have enough i don't have any sight so i'm only going what people told me at the time but yeah, yeah you would be able to get work done like this but the problem with some of them was that um that you needed to be able to write in your worksheet oh. and some of the gap between the camera and the platform was so low you couldn't get a pen in there oh no problem yeah, yeah. some of them were adjustable of course you but some one of those tiny ikea pencils <laughs> <laughs> pencilette but yeah i those those are some of my earliest school memories man so much stuff happened so much stuff happened you know i actually yeah I remember doing work in the library, and the library's furthest from the dining hall. So if you were lucky, I mean, it's terrible security, but if you were lucky, you could leave yourself logged in and save a thing, and then go to tea and come back. And I did this once, because we just got a new link between our school and some other schools. And I remember I found a way to get into that link and connect to another school, <laughs> right? Of course you did. There was a file on one of the computers. I think the computer was far away in London. The, con the connection was extremely slow. I mean, dog slow. And this file was just called Wildwood. And it was an audio file. And I thought, I'm really curious what this is because it's really big. So I downloaded this file and it took probably an hour. And it was a low-quality copy of Paul Weller's Wild Wood, the song. Oh. And that's how I first heard it, right? Low quality, I'd never heard it. And I didn't know what it was for years. And one day, I remember typing this up into Google, because this must have been like in 94 or 5, so a really long time ago. I never heard it in its full glory. And I eventually heard the song the way it was supposed to be heard. And I just remember loving the song initially, and I loved it more once I heard it properly. But yeah, had I not downloaded this thing from this God knows where it was. In a sneaky way. In a sneaky way. And the reason I mentioned it, um, being in the library is because I did that in the library and I went to tea while the thing was downloading. And back in the day, right, this was in DOS, not Windows, you would not have a progress bar. So you'd start something going and just hope that it didn't kill itself, you know? Yeah. So I had no idea when I came back if this thing had finished. The only thing you could do was sort of press enter and... If it said C colon, then you were done. And if it didn't, you just hoped it was still going. Yeah. But there was no progress bar, no speed, no nothing. So I have no idea what kind of speed it was doing or how long it was going to take. And then it would say one file copied. And then you go, ooh, it's done. Okay, what's it play? And then that was it. So that's a crazy memory that I remember. One of the, one of the weird ones. Esoteric. Mm -hmm. But yeah, many things. You missed out on a lot of this stuff because you went to a nice normal school and you didn't have to do all sorts of crazy things to survive. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I went to a girls' school. You still had to survive. Just tell us about girls' school. Way. I can't imagine, like, because my school was mixed, obviously. But um, yeah. Um, well, we were a girls' school next door to a boys' school, so that's trouble, surely. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're sort of separating them, but also sticking them next door to each other. Someone was so just they'd... playing games, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. So they've, you know, become sort of all the elusive boys next door. Um, Did you have a crush on any of them? No. You, you could see didn't... over the we... fence. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, they were very separate. There wasn't really a fence between. We just had the same, um, like, driveway. We shared a driveway that you could come down. But there were, diff you know, other entrance as well for the girls' school. Oh, yeah. Um... So no, we didn't really ever mix or 
uh, anything like that. And yeah, all I can say is that girls are horrid to each other, <laughs> you know, and we find that now with ours that boys, you know, if they have an issue, they might fight it out or whatever, but then it's over and done with. Right. They don't hold a grudge. They just can't be bothered. Whereas girls are bitchy and nasty and mean to each other and they conspire against each other and they do they tell tales, will don't they? Hold that grudge until the end of time. Um and that's They yeah. do seem to like making up stories about one another. Oh yes. So yeah. It's not always the best, you know, being in separate sex schools that's why i was quite keen for our kids as well to be in a mixed school i just would have assumed no different to be honest i forgot that separate schools like that existed yeah um particularly girls schools are quite popular because there is a belief that girls learn better um i mean maybe it's quite outdated but i remember hearing before that girls learn better in girls schools but boys learn better in mixed schools okay um so in the girls' school, did you learn all about all the pink jobs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we did not. It was we didn't have. What do they call it? There was that. Ah, oh, there's that topic that they used to have before our time. I forget. You know like where they home taught economics. Yeah, thing. that's the one. Um, no, the closest we had would have been food technology but everybody does that so yeah you know what mm -hmm. i have a, i have a few other things i want to tell you okay this one's going to terrify some people but i used to ride a bike oh gosh yes i used to ride a bike around the school car park in worcester or the kind of the main area not in not in the building right outside there was a water fountain there and uh, it so happened that there was a bike shed outside my house where i stayed and I found a bike I liked. I found a helmet I liked. And I was off. And I became a very avid bike rider. So the blind bike rider became a thing. In fact, I was even on TV doing this at some point. I have no idea where that clip ever ended up. It might have been like a Channel 5 thing or a Channel 4 thing. I've never seen it. But it did happen. And uh, the teachers used to just skip out the way. Uh, it was quite interesting. But yeah, I used to bike around Worcester's um, outdoor areas quite a lot. And I miss biking. Now, I know you hate biking with a passion, don't you? <laughs> it's not my thing, no. The last time I went on a bike was just before Jake was born. You were pregnant. And I went on a bike with my brother Dwayne. Tandem around uh, Hyde Park, I think it was, or Holland Park. One of those, the Serpentine. Where's that? Hyde Park. Hyde Park. Yeah, so um, it's one of those things I'd love to actually do more of. But yeah, school memories of a Saturday, biking all around the school campus and enjoying it immensely, particularly in the summer. A lot of exercise. If I had an Apple Watch, then I'd be fine. But no, no idea. I'd love, to, I'd love to get back into that. I'd like to go. I've done driving. I've done flying. Next thing, a massive open space where I can jump on a bike and someone can direct me not to hit things. All right. I'm on it. She's on it. <laughs> that was fun. And the last thing I'll mention, which is more back to technology, was what happens if you get a book that the school doesn't have in an accessible form back in the day? What do you do? Well, in that same library, next to my computer, I called it my computer. Of course it wasn't, but it felt like it. I used it a lot. Um, was a scanner. So what you do is you take the pages of the book that you needed and you would scan them. And it would convert that into something readable, like a text format. And back in the day, of course, these things took a lot longer than they do now. Now you could just use your phone and it's done in seconds. These things took minutes. And the more pages you gave it, it could take hours. And you just hoped it didn't crash. So one thing I remember was for my 15th birthday, I got a Yamaha keyboard. It was, in fact, the PSR 520. And I wanted to read all about it, the manual. And this manual was thick. Back in the day, that's what they did. It gave you thick printed manuals, right? <laughs> now it's just a PDF. But before PDFs, we had physical manuals. 
And so I remember trying to scan this thing. And what you don't know, of course, is, well, if you can, can't see, is that the front of the book or the back? Is it the right way up or is it upside down? So I distinctly remember the way that the scanning computer would say a particular phrase. Um, it would say, the page is sideways upside down. <laughs> and sideways upside down was like all one word. It was very funny to me. Wow. So sideways upside down, I guess probably meant turned through oh, more than 180, the next one along degrees. You know? Yeah. So that's what I imagine. And it, if it was straight, but slightly off, it would say the page is skew if. Wow. Skew if. Haven't heard that word in a long time. <laughs> that's a great word. But when it was right, you could get through a bunch of pages and when you'd scanned all of the pages in, it would start to process them and you could then start having your manual read out. And technology just wasn't what it is now, of course. So the reading of it was interspersed with random characters or maybe whole parts would be skipped and you just have to kind of make the best of it. Nowadays, you do this in seconds. You know, you take a snap and you're done. But I just remember the whir of the scanner and sitting there for hours upon hours between, well, between the end of school maybe and prep or tea and then prep. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, scanning all these pages of book and hoping that your scan was at least pretendable readable. <laughs> That's all we could do. But yeah, that is most of my school life is a technology remembrance. And a lot of this stuff I haven't thought about in many, many years, you know, but it kind of comes back to you over time. So it do. Talking about it unlocks, doesn't it? It does. It does. And I think you said that, for example, like when you were younger, um, you didn't do much with computers in school at all, right? Um, not really. Not so much. I mean, we had computing yeah. where we were, you know, learning to use and to make spreadsheets and Excel and all those kind of things. Oh, we did um, a bit of that, yeah. Yeah, and then I think towards towards the last few years, we we did more, but it was still nowhere near like what they do now. And you think the kids now, like our kids, they don't do any homework on physical paper, really. The only homework I've ever Maybe seen... Maybe maths. Yeah, is, you know, Jake might have a maths booklet, but even that, everything is a website for every other subject. There is nothing really written at all no um obviously in class it is and they have their books in class but the majority of their work is done on computers which is completely different to it is how we did it yeah um i did it work on computers of course but most of everything else was typed up although towards actually towards the end of my time there i do remember that i did have a school laptop and i used to actually um a friend of mine in the sixth form called Jody also had a school laptop. And I'm sure we didn't pass virtual notes back in and forward in English class at all. Because <laughs> back then you'd sit opposite each other and uh, the laptop had infrared, you know, like a TV remote. Yeah. And when two laptops were, I guess, mated almost virtually, <laughs> yeah, I know, um, it would make a connection and then you could send a file or type a, a text and it would come up on the other computer. So you, you, we would also not play Duke Nukem 3D during English at all. <gasps> Shocking. Never do that. No. We never did that. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, my life. Honestly, these things, they just keep coming. So before I incriminate myself any further, I'm going to go away now. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any last things you want to end with? No. No? No. I'm afraid. No, no last exciting things that happened? No. I'm afraid oh. I'm talked out. Talked out? Yeah. I need to finish my tea. Probably cold. Well, maybe. <laughs> there you go, school memories. I will. We will be back with I don't know what something sometime. Still looking forward to the Christmas one. Definitely. Gonna be good. Next week. Next week's December. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess it is. I think it's the first of December this weekend. Yep. Are you putting up the tree? I'm not putting up the tree, but. We will have, although Alice would love to, she's desperate for the tree. But there will be hints of Christmas throughout the house. Okay. 
I can live with that. And advent calendars, of course. Right. Yeah. But and we'll, we'll we can talk about that. Play Heart Christmas on the speaker. Definitely. Which I know you like. Love it. All right, then. It's been a fun one. <laughs> it has. Enjoy your day. And if uh, you have any comments, leave them on YouTube or via our website. And if you want to do that, we'd love to hear from you about your school memories. I'm sure you have loads. And hopefully we've opened up a door <laughs> of things that you can think about. Or depending on how old you are, you might still be having school memories, which is fine too. Tell us about them. Right. Without further ado, I wish you well. Ow. You all right? I just need the, the keyboard stand. Well, that's not nice. No, it isn't. But what is nice is... Hello, strangers. Welcome to StrangeCast episode 11. Welcome or welcome back if you're new. You didn't say it the right way. I guess I didn't. <laughs> you threw me off. Oh, boring. <laughs> well, because I know that a lot of new listeners. Let me do it again. Okay. Fine, fine. <laughs> you have to follow the pattern, otherwise I don't know where I am. <laughs> All right, fine.